This is the Sunday stream opening song because the other song is copyrighted. La 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 Oh look, here comes Dog Cat Fox! Hi, Sky! Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sunday stream. The stream I do on Sundays, because Sunday is the day to stream on Sundays. Hope you're all doing well on this beautiful Sunday morning. It actually is kind of nice out. It's all sunny and bright, and this web page I'm on is animated to automatically scroll through stuff, so I can't do anything about that right now. I'll just have to live through it. Either way, hope you're all doing well on this beautiful Sunday morning. Before I get into today's uh, topic, I do have a confession to make. I know, I know, big scandalous confession. Uh, unbeknownst to me, now we'll like, back up a little bit. Uh, I discovered and as well had other people tell me about Bridge uh, a month or two ago, at least. Uh, but because of just, you know, other things coming up and all sorts of stuff, I didn't end up covering it until today. In the interim, however, uh, another YouTuber uh, had uh, unveiled it to the world. And I think she did it uh, on her own channel as well as on Side Scrollers and uh, It's a Gundam. And so I don't want it to be said that I was unaware, or well, at least now I'm aware, but I was, uh, I'm not doing this as a duplicative thing to somebody else. I didn't know until last night that this had been done by somebody else or had been looked at. Uh, so I want to give credit where credit is due for, um, you know, broadcasting the existence of Bridge uh, to, uh, it's either Yanchi or Yanch, I'm not quite sure. Either way, a link to her uh, YouTube channel is in the description. And uh, as well, unbeknownst to me, the materials I picked out to look at, or at least part of them for today, had already been looked at by Yanchi. I have not watched any of her videos, I will confess. So whatever comes out of my mouth is entirely my own thinking and thoughts and so on. But I wanted to give credit where credit is due. So there you go for that. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, uh, sensitivities when it comes to accidentally covering other YouTubers' subject matter, uh, you can speak to Ranting Monkey about how we first really started talking to each other. Anyway, all that is preamble. Who's joining me on this beautiful Sunday morning? Molly Okami. Good morning, Zombie Teddy. Good morning, Noah Asensio. Good morning, Mike R. Good morning, Kieverdam. Good morning to you. And thank you, Kieverdam, as always, for providing the links to the GoFundMes for our friends Moonshock, Natalie, Angela Ariaga, James Colley, and Rhonda. Links are up in the top of the chat box there. If you can donate to those, <clears throat> excuse me, please do so. If you can't, that's fine. But if you can share those out on social media, that would help out as well. So thank you ahead of time for that. Roasted Opinions, good morning. Advocatus Diaboli, good morning. Spoonie the Rebel, good morning. Seftus Wolf, good morning. Vader 35, good morning. And Derek LaRue, good morning to you. And thank you so much, Derek, as always, for your uh, generosity and support. Really, really do appreciate it. Hope you're having a good Sunday, and I hope you enjoy the show. Kiro Soldier, good morning. Some Namdiel Nation, good morning. John Trioxin, good morning. Who else is there? Jamie Milquist, good morning. Robert Pincus, good morning to you. Shadowclaw, good morning. Tex Bishop X, Tex Bishop X, hey, good morning. TC Lachance, good morning. Michael Sander, good morning. Ercole Di Stefano, good morning. Brittany Holland, good morning to you. Well, it's Raziel, good morning. Dosvidania, or whatever else. I, I I don't know Russian. I really don't. I, I know one phrase. I I know one phrase that may or may not be pronounced correctly. Pronounced. I don't know. Hochist ya blutni pitrzok, grajdanin or grajdanka, depending on male or female or something. That's it. Uh, Zero the Hero, 909. Good morning. Tear Alexander, the Scourge. Oh, the Scourge. Oh, not the Gentleman Lich anymore. Oh, you changed your, your, your entire adjustment of your attitude. All right. Well, hey. Ryan R., good morning. Anybody else? I think that's it. Oh, TC, good morning to you. And I think that's everyone. If I missed you, if you're lurking, if you're in the future, good morning. Oh, and Colleen, Colleen B. says good morning. Well, you mean... Senior staff reporter and chief Florida correspondent, Colleen Bernier. Well, good morning to you, Colleen Bernier. Because every day's a yay with Colleen Bernier. All right. Well, so there's this thing called bridge. It's this thing. Uh, it's a, not a thing called love. It's a thing called bridge. And what is bridge? Well, we're going to find out today. So what I'm going to do, we're going to go over their uh, their website a bit. 
And then, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Let's try that again. Okay. Can we get to the home page? Do I have to, what do I have to do? It keeps, it keeps animating itself away. Okay. Let's see if we can stick there. We're going to talk about Bridge. Bridge seems to be a rebranding of DEI or an attempt to rebrand a DEI. It's sort of like, oh, you know, uh, attempt to coin new buzzword or buzz phrase. And so we're going to go over the uh, website a bit. We're going to take a look at some of the information about Bridge. And then we're going to watch some video. We're going to watch some video of members of the Bridge board and see what they have to say and where their minds are at on all of this. Um, there are many members of the Bridge board. So I've got two videos for today. One is relatively short. The other one is relatively lengthy. And there are others that I will do probably in a series on Bridge in the near future. But let's start with an overview of what is Bridge. Bridge is a purpose-driven community, biased to action, focused on the workplace, biased to action, focused on words, uh, workforce and marketplace. The Bridge mission is to create a cultural shift in companies where DEI principles flow through all facets of an organization from the C-suite and marketing through product development, procurement, and customer service. All right, so first off, how is this any different than DEI in the first place? Because DEI, as we know, is always built in, it's, it's in the air that we breathe, it's filtered into everything that we do, it's part of every process and so on. What is bridge? Uh, with a with the variety of programs that Bridge offers, oh, it's a service, okay, including proprietary research, storytelling workshops, events, and more. We identify, dismantle, and rethink the structures in place that currently contribute to the gap in belonging, representation, inclusion, diversity, and equity. Bridge is an acronym for these. Um, okay. My English major is kicking in belonging, representation, inclusion, diversity, and equity. Where's the G? I, I got the B. I got the R. I got the I. I got the D. I got the E. There's no G. Um, Hey, uh, bridge, if you're listening and it would be funny if you were, uh, might I suggest, uh, gratitude. How about gratitude? I hear about gratitude a lot. You know, and then people trying to make themselves feel all sort of high and mighty and, and enlightened about things. How about gratitude? Uh, our long-term goal, with the help of our founding board members, which we'll take a look at more closely soon, composed of DEI and business leaders, is to create a comprehensive bridge agenda for all companies and to subsequently certify against its implementation and measure its impact. Certif certify against its implementation. What? Okay, that must be some legal speak that I just don't understand. And then for those of you listening at home, there is a, a circle progressive chart thing here. Um, let, let's see. So this, is the pro this is the bridge process, the bridge value framework. We'll start at the uh, top left. The voices of inclusion. Research will identify the gaps that prevent and Wait, what? Identify the gaps that prevent and the practices that contribute to a diverse workplace and marketplace. Uh, so basically, we're going to do a survey of your workforce for gender and or racial demographics, and then the disparities between what is a correct balance versus an incorrect balance uh, that will set our goals. I'm, I'm just interpreting here. Uh, next step, the assessment tool will help determine the unique gaps that exist for each company. Uh, that's the exact same step as the first one. You're, you're, you're determining the quote unquote gaps as in the racial demographic disparities that you find objectionable. For the most part, there'll probably be gender ones in there too, but okay. Uh, the bridge agenda, sorry, this is step three. The bridge agenda bridges the gaps in the workplace, workforce, and marketplace to create a cultural shift. Uh, so you're going to set percentile goals for hiring and promotion practices to change those demographic disparities. Okay. And lastly, the, the measurement will track and benchmark internal impact and real transformation. Uh, so you're just going to, again, keep a 
keep an eye on the percentile differences between the racial demographics in your workforce. Well, that's a lot of fancy words for talking about the exact same stuff that DEI has been doing this whole time. Hmm. All right. Yeah. So step one and step two are the same step. Step three is uh, actually, I think it's step three. The bridge agenda is there be dragons, at least legally speaking, and as well as the measurement. Because if you're measuring success by, you know, how many of the correct skin colors you have in your workforce or, or uh, how many women versus men and so on, that's where you're that's where you're stepping into some sketchy territory, legally speaking. Admittedly, I'm not a lawyer. I can't say whether or not any of this is tempting fate with legality, but I at least have a good idea. All right, so that's that's uh, f- frame number one on this web page. What's next? Oh, join us for Bridge 24. Inclusion is good for business. Learn more. Oh, shall we learn more? Okay. Uh, uh, inclusion is good for business. May 5th through 7th, 2024, La Jolla, California. Get actionable DEI and inclusion strategies from the top diversity, marketing, and business executives driving systemic change. Oh boy. We've looked at several of those over the course of years, haven't we, everyone? Also, good morning, Mike Savage. And also, good morning, Avshara Grastus. I hope I said that correctly. Uh, Launched in 2023 with an incredible NPS score. I don't know what that is. Of 91.3. I mean, that must be good. The annual Bridge two and a half day retreat is curated specifically for chief diversity officers, CMOs, CEOs, and other senior leaders. Focused on how you can future-proof your business by maximizing inclusion for growth, Bridge24 will provide you with a framework of practices steeped in research and business capabilities to build inclusive brands and companies across the workplace and marketplace. By unlocking the powerful collaboration between CDOs, CMOs, and CEOs at the retreat and in your own organization, we will guide you on how to decentralize inclusion by shifting its dependency away from individuals, functions, or beliefs to placing it squarely on concrete operating policies, processes, and practices. We will work together to create actionable breakthrough ideas and innovations to forge ahead in dismantling barriers and driving systemic change for every individual individual to thrive based on who they truly are as valued contributors. And together with our rising stars, we will define the future for the next generation who are more committed than ever to social causes, racial justice. <laughs> I love racial justice. It's it's justice predicated on race. <laughs> Uh, and an expectation that it is the role of companies to make the world a better place. Get ready for an extraordinary retreat where you will walk away invigorated and galvanized to build a more inclusive industry. Boy, howdy. Gosh, I I don't even need any sugar or corn pops. I, I've got all the energy I need just from reading that that amazing text of oh, energy and, and, and forward thinking and ooh, innovation. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. Step into the spice. Anyway. Uh, view the 2024 agenda. Oh, good. Uh, board of directors lunch. Oh, so nobody who's not on the board of directors can't eat. Okay. Uh, and then board of directors meeting. So they need an hour for lunch, three hours for the meeting. Oy, that's got it. Okay. Stronger together. Cocktails and connections. Oh, I'm sure nothing could possibly go sideways with that. Uh, let's see. Next, we have uh, a welcome to Bridge 24, a 15-minute talk by Cheryl Daiha. Daiha? I don't know how to say her last name. I will, I, I'm sure we'll hear, hear it later pronounced correctly. Uh, we might be looking at something later on that. And then we have keynote speaker, Dr. Bertice Berry, sociologist and best-selling author, named Comedian of the Year. Uh, Okay. Lecturer of the Year and Entertainer of the Year. Named by whom? Then there will be a Cinco de Mayo celebration and dinner. Oh, good. Uh, and then we'll have the power of your why. The power we wield in advertising is immense. We mold global perspectives and influence cust- consumer choices and societal norms. The best stories and creative work comes with informed perspective on society and culture backed by data. 
But the best creative work is fueled by a why, the thing that drives and motivates our work. Hosted by Walter T. Gear, Chief Executive Officer, Innovation North America of VML, whatever VML is. And then we have another Stronger Together, Fire Pits and Friendship. Oh, boy. So you get cocktails and you get s'mores. Oh, joy. How much does it cost to go to this thing? <laughs> what What's the registration on this sucker for a couple of cheap cocktails and some marshmallows? <laughs> Uh, what happens on Monday, May 6th? We have breakfast. I'm sure it's a continental breakfast. Oh, and then a little 10-minute uh, welcome from Janita Wilson, Chief Diversity Officer of Discover. We might be hearing from her shortly as well. Then another welcome from the CEO and founder, Cheryl Daiha. Then we have session one, keynote fireside chat. Oh, is FDR in the house? How the change happens, the intersection between marketing, business, and DEI practices. Oh, boy. Explore how the powerful collaboration unlock... Wait, what? Explore how the powerful collaboration unlock between CMOs and CDOs can drive exponential business growth by leveraging inclusion as an imperative business practice demanding the same rigor you apply to your other business practices. <gasps> you will hear firsthand what it means to what it means to bring a DEI lens to marketing and business, empowering CDOs to deliver value to the work of DEI beyond the workplace and become a contributor of driving business impact and how CMOs can gain clarity on where the gaps in the marketing and brand inclusion to help them be intentional about where to focus their efforts to achieve their growth KPIs. <sighs> This magical partnership provides the concrete approach every organization needs to jointly lead the building of inclusive brands and companies. Okay, somebody needs a copy editor or something. That is that is a run on that is a 150 yard dash of a sentence right there. Holy cats. All right, moving on. Uh, session 2A, inclusion as the new marketing metric. Brands are 23 years behind. 23 years. Okay, what was going on in 2001? Oh, wait. I know what was going on in 2000. Wait, what? By 2045. Oh, 23 years from now? Oh, or is that math? Is that math correctly? Anyway, by 2045, the white community will be less than 50% of the overall U.S. population. Yes, don't you know, everyone, that white people are all part of the same club? <laughs> don't you know that? Yeah, that, that's why everybody who lives in the Bay Area is completely on board with everybody who lives in Dallas, who's white, J just so you know. Anyway, additionally, Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, and Indigenous Americans yield $3 trillion of buying power. Uh, okay, so this is all a profit motive. Okay. Uh, the LGBTQIA plus community holds an estimated $3.9 trillion dollars. And people with differences in abilities have close to $500 billion in buying power. Yet brand marketers are an alarming 23 years behind in their representation of these core groups. Groups, you say, not demographics. Groups, yeah, there, there's no demographics. There's nothing more abstract than that. It's communities and groups. In this session, we will reveal groundbreaking research that shares the representation of these populations across the top 200 brands and we'll have a candid discussion of the moves brands need to make to catch up. The move of the moves brands need to make to catch. Okay. All right. And the speakers on this one are Dr. Omar Rodriguez Villa, uh, or Villa, not quite sure, a professor in the practice of marketing and the director of education, business, and society, Institute Guizirch Business School, Emory University. Oh, for a second there, I thought it was going to say Stanford, and I'd have a whole other reaction. And the moderator is Yin Woon Rani, CEO and CMO of Milk Pep. Uh, yeah, okay. Session 2B, inclusion is good for business. You keep telling me that. It's almost like a mantra. Unlock your brand growth. From organizational structure to marketplace impact, this session will explore how inclusion is the untapped growth engine for companies. Join us on a journey through Bridges' revolutionary IMAX framework is this taking place in a giant screened theater 
IMAX framework exploring five core dimensions. Five dimensions? Oh my gosh, okay. Uh, of what it takes to build an inclusive brand. Bridge IMAX, inclusion, maturity, assessment, and capability building. Wait, that doesn't... No, that... Why don't you call it IMAC? Like, I M A C. <laughs> Inclusion, maturity, assessment, and capability building, or I, I M A C. I okay. I, you know, I I might be wrong. I could be mistaken, but I think you guys ought to be careful for some trademark infringement on calling yourselves the IMAX. Anyway, uh, we'll help you future-proof your business by decentralizing inclusion. What does that mean? Shifting its dependency from individuals, functions, or beliefs to structured operating policies. Yeah, we heard this before. Uh, we will dig into what it takes to lay a strong foundation, how you see, serve, and show up in the market, as well as how you can extend these practices into advocacy. Oh, right, because we're also going to be activists during all of this, of course. Offering a distinct competitive advantage, Bridge IMAX allows you, for the very first time, to assess your inclusion maturity across your business practices, pinpoint your gaps, i.e. racial disparities, and build capabilities that result in a more inclusive and profitable future. Um, okay, hosted by several people who we may or may not get to. And then Bridge Stories, the 8 o'clock call at 11 a.m. Okay, and it's a 10-minute. Okay, stronger together, mix and mingle. More drinking, more oh, only 20 minutes. You're only allotted 20 minutes to mix and mingle? Man, I don't know if I can flirt in that amount of time. Okay, session number three, the future of work, the impact of Gen Z, AI, and hybrid work. That's a lot of ground to cover. Since the pandemic, the world of work has significantly transformed. So what does the future of work look like? You need a comma there, at least. Anyway, we believe there are three major influences. Gen Z is predicted to constitute 23% of the global workforce by 2024. We're already in 2024, so I guess it's here. And they are also estimated to be the most ethnically diverse generation. Oh, good. What does that say about them? At all. Having witnessed their Gen X parents endure struggles in the workplace firsthand, this vibrant generation is fresh with ideas and the creativity to make a tangible difference in the future workplace and its culture. Why? What? Why are they fresh with ideas? What? How do you know this? According to EY, EY? What's EY? To EY's recently released Work Reimagined Survey, Gen AI, oh, is that what we're calling it now? Gen AI? Gen AI is, quote, expected to have an outsized impact on the labor market, on career and learning pathways, and on the realities of work, unquote. Why? Tell me, EY, why? And remote work is also changing. Not really. You either work remotely or you don't. Much to the dismay of many employees who favor the remote lifestyle of the pandemic. Well, yes, now that there isn't a federally mandated separation of people, a lot of companies are expecting people to come back to the office. It's true. Uh, I've been fortunate enough in the fact that the pandemic gave my company the rather fortuitous excuse of, well, since we can all work remotely, we don't need this giant office space anymore to house people so we can get rid of that, reduce our you know, infrastructure budget down to basically a tiny closet in an office building somewhere and just have people work remotely. Uh, but not every company's like that. Some people want you there and yeah, there's good excuse, good arguments for that. 100% re remote work is becoming less common with the pendulum shifting towards hybrid models. Yes, it's true. Uh, bridge stories against all odds in only 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, when Madison was born, her parents were told she would never walk, talk, or be able to hold a job. The expectations were incredibly deflating, and Madison was being set up for failure before she even had a chance to start. Madison has spent her life defying odds and proving people wrong. It's one of her favorite things to do. Madison will tell her story while also emphasizing the importance of diversity, inclusion, and seeing underrepresented people in all facets of employment and life. Okay, so the, 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 the lesson is, don't judge a book by its cover, you say. I agree. 
so why is this entire organization talking about nothing but uh, optics? Never mind. Oh, here we go. The impact of the SCOTUS affirmative action decision on business and the ways to continue to build towards equity. Yes, even in the face of the unconstitutional nature of the diversity argument for discrimination in opportunities and access, what will DEI do? On June 9th, oh, sorry, pardon me. <clears throat> on June 29th, 2023, the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS, overturned affirmative action, a decision that ended the ability for public or private universities to consider race and the end goal of racial diversity in their practice and process of admissions. While the ruling applied specifically to educational institutions, the business community has and will continue to absorb the downstream effects of racially unjust systems and structures that perpetuate unequal access to education and opportunities for historically marginalized populations. Oh, so you're going to basically spit in the face of the constitutionality of what you're doing. Okay, while this was undoubtedly a blow to progress, was it a blow to progress, though? Was a hand-waved violation of Title VI and the 14th Amendment a blow to progress? Or was it a long overdue to die, not DEI, but die, holdover, from the early days of the Civil Rights Act's passage. That should have died off a long time ago. Eh. Uh, well, this was undoubtedly a blow to progress. Kenji Yoshina, quote, believes the court has left plenty of room to continue advancing diversity and inclusion in the workplace, unquote. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. You're right. The affirmative action decision had nothing directly to do with private business. That's what Title VII has been for this entire time. And every time that any business decides to set an agenda or a goal for hiring or promotion based around percentiles involving race or gender or ethnicity or, uh, or, or you know, orientation, they are, at the very least, stepping on Title VII and probably committing an illegal act. But anyway... Hopefully that'll catch up in the near future. He further believes that diversity and inclusion initiatives extend beyond the policies that travel under the moniker of affirmative action, including at least three varieties of diversity and inclusion, de-biasing work, ambient work, and universal work. Oh boy, we'll have to keep an eye on, on these new phrases. De-biasing. De-biasing. There was, there was something about removing bias at the beginning of all this. Okay. Um... Uh, do I care to read all of this? Not really. So instead, let's move on just to make sure I haven't missed anything important here. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. What's the overview? Now let's go to the homepage. This. Oh, here we go. Incl okay, Bridge IMAX. Uh, trademark infringement waiting to happen. Okay. Uh, introducing Bridge IMAX, a revolutionary framework that reveals 72 business practices across five dimensions in the organization, laying the foundation for building inclusive brands and companies. Oh boy, by measuring inclusion maturity, inclusion maturity. Uh, so I, I think that has to mean that we have a model of some kind of racial parity that has to take place, some kind of statistical balance that is the ideal. And then measuring maturity means how mature, i.e. how close does your current workforce demographic match to our idealized mix? If it's closer to ours than not, you're more mature. If it's farther away, you're less mature. That's my guess. Uh, by measuring inclusion maturity at both the brand and company levels, the brand level, how do you measure that at the brand level? IMAX mm -hmm, equips diversity, marketing, and business leaders with the following, okay? Inclusion assessment, determine where gaps exist. Yeah, intentional prioritization process. This is, this all resolves down to what is the demographic mix of your workforce and then making intentional moves to shift those demographic numbers. That's it. That's it. Oh, we have some, we have some charts here. Brand inclusion maturity score. Maturity score by dimension. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, Identify pinpoint gaps. Pinpoint gaps. What is this? Uh, it's all very, very tiny text. Training to avoid cultural appropriation. 
DEI checkpoints in marketing process. Leaders accountable for inclusive growth. DEI as criteria and performance evaluations. DEI as compensation, sorry, DEI as criteria for compensation. Public DEI targets. Aha. Uh -huh. What else do we have? Representation and marketing team. Oh, how do you figure that one? Representation and marketing leadership. Oh boy, how do you change that if those numbers are off? And another circle one, inclusion experience as a part of employee engagement surveys. Boy, I tell you what, this is all very, very interesting. What's this one here? Organizational practice, culture and structure, governance. Mid-inclusion maturity brand. Boy, you know, somebody spent a whole lot of time making gigantic, complex, detailed charts all to say, we're really trying to justify being racist and sexist. <laughs> anyway, anyway, let's move on to some material. Oh, sorry. Wait, I, I forgot the I forgot the most important part. Pardon me. I have to go back. Pardon me. I forgot something. We have to talk about the leadership. We have to talk about the leadership of Bridge before we get there. So this is the executive committee. Now, I have done some painstaking research to try to find some examples of the various figures listed here talking about their DEI initiatives or philosophies. I've been able to find a handful that have posted, at least as easily as I could find, uh, video evidence of what they think regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, today we're gonna cover, at least first, we're gonna cover Janita Wilson from Discover. She is the chair of Bridge, uh, because her video is brief. It's about two or three minutes long. So we're going to cover her first, a little bit out of order. But then we're going to look at an interview with Cheryl Dieha, or Dieha. Not quite sure how to say it. I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll learn shortly. Uh, that is a just under an hour long, I think, interview. We probably won't get to the whole thing, but we're going to take a look at it either way. And we're going to find out uh, what our executive committee members think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how, and, and presumably what they are bringing to the bridge. Uh, I've also found videos for several of the other people on the executive committee. Uh, I'll be doing those in separate streams in a sort of series on the, let's call them the, the faces of bridge. Sure, the faces of bridge. Not the face of Bo, but the faces of bridge. And so we're going to start out with Janita Wilson, and then we'll move on to Cheryl Dieha. Who, again, Janita Wilson is the chair, while Cheryl Dieha is the CEO and founder of Bridge. So we're going to take a look at the uh, chief potentate of Bridge shortly. But first, let's listen to the chair of Bridge, uh, Janita Wilson. And she works for Discover. Uh, but before I get to that, let me switch up my presentation here slightly just to keep in line with the Sunday stream. There we go. See, that, that seems more appropriate, doesn't it? More professional. Uh, but I have, in my reading of the website, uh, obviously uh, changed my uh, focus away from chat for a little bit. So let's go back to chat and see what, uh, see what people have to say. Advocates Diably. Well, they are Gen AI, as in the Gen A with the I attached to separated. It just happens to have a double meaning. Okay. I mean, I mean that, that sounds about as corporate speak as the rest of it. So, sure. Uh, roasted opinion, another example of Gen X being sidelined by activist millennials. Yes, those old fogey Gen Xs, they don't know anything anymore. We have the fresh ideas. Uh, we've never had to use the Dewey Decimal System. You know, Conan the Librarian. Hmm. Everything's been handed to us on a silver platter through the internet and uh, social media. Now, th those people that have all that prior experience to a world without all this convenience, they don't know anything. Our ideas are better. That we'll probably come up with ideas that were thought up years and years ago because we don't bother thinking that the past is useful for anything. Uh, let's see. Uh, Advocaz Diaboli again. When does the giant purple ball meet the tiny red ball? I, I love comments out of context. I, I love comments out of context. Who else is here? Oh, Detura Jones. Good morning to you. Uh, let's see. Not bridges, just bridge. Yes, just bridge, where the G means nothing. 
I mean, if you're going to have a G in a spot within your construct, you might as well give it something to do. That's that's the best I can do on a Sunday. Anyway, let's move on to the chair of bridge, uh, Janita Wilson at Discover. Hello and welcome. Oh, well, thank you for the welcome. As we present our first diversity, equity, and inclusion report, uh -huh. we are proud of the foundation we have built and optimistic about the future. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad optimism's very optimistic. At Discover, we see DE&I as more than just the right thing to do. It's a business imperative. We see it as a core business practice essential to our success. Oh, okay. Well, six of one thing, half a dozen of the other. A diverse organization attracts the best talent, oh. retains the best talent, oh. and makes better decisions. It does. Well, now I have to wonder, what is a Discover stock price? Do, 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 do. Not stonk price. Stop that price. There we go. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, oh, shall I, shall I show this briefly? Yeah, let's, let's show this briefly. Um, uh, oh, I have to stop the screen. Of course I do. Okay. Well, let's, let's do this. Um, do, 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 do. <laughs> What's discover stock price? Well, it's kind of. Kind of down, kind of down. What about the last five years? Oh, oh, okay, I take it back. It's gone up. It's gone up from 2020. All right, it's gone up. It's dipped here, there, and otherwise. Uh, in the last year, oh, a little, a little shaky in the last year. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, oh, okay, oh, they're, they're doing okay. Oh, oh, oh. No, th this, this has been a particularly bad month, I guess, slightly. Anyway, okay, I take it back. I, I guess... I guess uh, diversity is is working well for Discover. Okay, I apologize. I just I just I just had to find out. I wasn't sure, so we'll see. All right. Anyway, back to the video. All of which allow us to better serve our employees, mm. customers, and the communities in which we operate. How? I mean, I know I'm not going to get an answer, but I'd love to know exactly how that works. From opening a customer care center in Chicago South Side mm -hmm. to establishing measures to identify and address biases. Like? Together we have set ambitious goals to hold ourselves accountable for oh. creating meaningful change. I, I've asked this several times. I've had a couple of vague examples presented before, but I've always wondered, like, what, what does accountability look like? Like if, if I don't hit the diversity goals of the company, what happens? Do I get fired? Do I get demoted? You know, or is it the whole compensation package thing, right? If I hit the goals, I get an extra bonus on the racial mix of the people that I hire. We are taking an intentional approach to DE&I mm -hmm. as we relentlessly pursue our mission of helping people achieve brighter financial futures. Oh, is that the goal of DEI? To achieve brighter financial futures? Oh, okay. Discover is a place where everyone can build and advance their careers. What if I'm not of a desirable skin color for your metrics? What what happens to me then? Do I do I have do I get to be part of a class action suit in the future? And as we work toward a more diverse, equitable Okay, okay, more diverse and <laughs> Look, look at all that diversity, everybody. Boy, oh boy, there's a whole lot of diversity going on at Discover, isn't there? An inclusive workplace and world. We hope to inspire others to join us. Sure you do. Learn from our shared experiences. Uh-huh. And explore what we can all do to be better. Be better. Okay. So it's a, it's a, it's a obviously it's a moral argument. Okay, but now it's a quality of life argument. Okay, or quality of character, perhaps. 
It takes a village to truly affect change. Oh, okay. And while our journey is ongoing and never ending. Ongoing and never ending. Uh, the war must always be fought. We know we will succeed together. Oh, okay. And and that's it. That is the end of the video. That is the end of that video. All right. So there's a brief uh, delay here. Okay. So that was Janita Wilson giving us the high-minded, fluffy, nice, all sounds very positive uh, overview of what DEI is. Of course, we know better, don't we? Uh, now we're going to move into the main event. Uh, this is an interview with the founder of Bridge. I don't know if they will talk about Bridge, but it's possible. We're going to hear from uh, the person at the core of Bridge. What do you call like core? Like, uh, like C-O-R-E. You get like some equity in there, some uh, representation. Yeah, what's the O for? Uh, oh my God, what are we doing to ourselves? And C, you know, corporate liability maybe. So core. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so we're going to listen to Cheryl Daiha. Maybe the moderator or the, the interviewer will pronounce it for me and I don't have to guess anymore. Let's find out what she has to say. So, Cheryl, tell us, first of all, about you and, you know, who you are and how you got into this. And then talk to oh. us a little bit about this trade association. OK, so, yes, this is the on the right is the founder of Bridge and on the left is. Uh, the interviewer who does a show called DEI After Five, the show, uh, the equity equation or something. Oh boy, here we go. Yes. Um, okay, so I was born in South Africa, lived under the apartheid regime. Um, uh, and so at a very early age, I understood what inequities looked like. You understood what inequities looked like. And so you decided to champion a DEI centric organization. Boy, oh boy, is that some self-imposed blindness there. Uh, and that spurred my passion for social justice. So mm. I was always committed um, to social justice in, in all its forms. And I, when I came to the, the U.S., I thought that I was going to see something very different. But, you know, obviously there were differences, but, you know, still in, inequities. Oh, yeah, yeah. The United States that you arrived in was exactly like apartheid South Africa. Okay. Um, I'm also part of a multiracial family. I see the, mm -hmm. the world through my son's eyes. You see the world through your son's eyes? Is this like being John Malkovich or something? And so it's very personal for me to change um, the trajectory of opportunities that are uh, available for um, black and brown people in this country uh -huh. um, and certainly for the next generation. Okay, so you have a preferred set of racial demographics that you are working to help versus anyone else of a different set of racial demographics. Okay. Uh, so that's like, that's my personal, uh, my personal background. Mm -hmm. My professional background is um, I'm a consummate marketer. I started um, my career in the health and beauty aid industry. I was uh, recruited into the technology industry. Mm -hmm. um, and then after 9-11, I found myself... Uh, recruited into the, the industry trade group. Oh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, this is... I, I wasn't sure if this interview was done before uh, Bridge was founded or after, but now we've got confirmation. Also, as always, I have to occasionally break up the stream with me saying something or doing something because, you know, YouTube. So if I have any awkward pauses, that's why. That, that's the excuse I give. Every awkward pause I have is YouTube's fault, just so you know. Um, world. And I had, I, I quite frankly didn't, I wasn't even familiar with uh, with industry trade groups at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I ended up being the general manager for the IAB, which is the Interactive Advertising Bureau. And then most recently, the chief strategy officer at the MMA, which is focused on mobile marketing. And, um, you know, I, as part of my role, I was able to bring together, right, the, 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 the power of industry trade groups is bringing together the industry to create marketing platforms, to create a marketplace of, you know, buying and selling uh, media, et cetera. Uh-huh. And so what does any of that have to do with the skin color of the participants? And so um, after the murder of George Floyd, 
Uh, of course, you know, I should have a stinger just for any time somebody brings up the murder of George Floyd as a uh, excuse for taking action, you know, or, or as a justification for some kind of DEI thing or something, because boy, oh boy, between George Floyd and the pandemic, no, nobody brings up Trayvon Martin anymore, right? They don't bring up Trayvon Martin. Uh, uh, they, they only bring up George Floyd. It's always George Floyd. I had the distinct pleasure and honor of being introduced to a number of chief diversity officers at that time. Uh -huh. And we ended up, you know, it was a time, right? Like when everyone wanted to just kind of be together. Yes, boy, you know, it really was a, a time of togetherness when George Floyd died. Did you see all the togetherness in those riots? <laughs> um, COVID was kind of happening. Kind of happening? I guess it was kind of happening after the lockdowns began. Yeah. And so we would, we would meet um, every few weeks. We would just meet as a group. Uh -huh. And um, it occurred to me in those conversations yeah. that being a chief diversity officer in corporate America is a lonely road. It is. And I, I talked about this a little bit on the discord, by the way, I have a discord server and, uh, you can join it later on if I give you the link. Well, I will give you the link, but you have to wait. Um, yeah, I, I, I talked. We, we watched several videos last week about uh, chief diversity officers talking about their process and their careers and everything else. And and the one word that kept coming up over and over again, which I found really interesting, was lonely. How lonely the job is. And I started thinking about why they didn't really get into it that deeply. But I started thinking, why would it be a lonely job to be in? And it just kind of occurred to me, and this is just sort of my um, my uh, uh, sort of thought process on it, is, uh, you know, that they make DEI part and parcel with everything in a business, right? They, they say that. That's that's the language. That's, that's the rhetoric, is that's part of everything that we do. And so if you have a DEI officer or chief executive DEI diversity officer, whatever, in a company, that means that technically they have to be part of and involved in every element of the business, at least on the surface, or at least for performative sake, right? To, to show off how well DEI is embedded in everything that they do. But how do you find someone that has anything useful to offer to the multiple elements of your business, whether it's marketing or sales or accounting or HR? You can't find a jack of all trades like that that doesn't simply possess the most surface level skills or knowledge about all of those elements. So if the chief diversity officer shows up in the sales department, what are they going to do? What do they have to tell uh, you know, career professionals in sales about their own job? That isn't going to be something like, you guys need to not be so biased or something. Right. They, 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 they're, they're everywhere, right? DEI is meant to be everywhere. And yet the DEI chief executive officer belongs nowhere. They have no specific role or utility in any of the departments that they technically oversee. So they've got nothing to offer. They've got nothing to do. They don't belong anywhere, yet they have to be present everywhere. That has to be a lonely place to be, doesn't it? If you think about it, at least that's how I see it. So insofar as I can have sympathy for someone in charge of systemic racism in a company, <laughs> I guess I guess that's the amount of sympathy I can extend. That yeah, it's got to be a pretty lousy place to be to be in that situation. Uh, a lot of times, as you just said, right, they were on the outside of business um, and they were told to fix things. And it wasn't really their job, right, to fix. Yes, it is. It's their job to fix things. We've already we've already heard this. They're there to see to and implement strategies to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in the company. That's their job description. Now, whether or not they are allowed to do that, whether or not they could conceivably do that without blatantly violating laws that DEI already kind of violates, I don't know. But that is their job, to fix a problem. But given the salaries that DEI executives pull down, they sure as heck better be there to fix the problem. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I thought to myself, well, how? why would we not use the power of an industry trade group 
to drive change against a purpose as opposed to just building platforms uh, for marketers. What is that? This is all corporate speak. I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. And so Bridge was born out of that. Um, and so, you know, as you said, we are now the first independent DE&I trade group for the global marketing industry. Wow. Okay. I, I, I am very impressed, but not really. I just wish I would have met you some years ago. <laughs> Why? <laughs> to be a part of this. Uh, it just started last year, so you can you can still get in on the proverbial ground floor. Um, because well, you know, as you were saying, you know these these chief diversity officers, you know, being brought in to fix things. I was told um, that my job was to make things look pretty because I was in marketing. Uh, well, that that's not a bad description of what DEI officers are there to do: make things look pretty based on the aesthetic pleasure of the left wing in this country. Um, and I was like, that's not what I do. But uh, what do you do? <laughs> no. um, and so I appreciate the fact that, you know, it is a trade association. It uh -huh. is um, not just a marketing trade association, but that focus on diversity and inclusion. Because diversity is a trade. <laughs> I mean, as much money as they've dumped into it over the last five or 10 years, I guess that's probably true. And so what makes that different than like the American Marketing Association or any other you know, association yeah. that's focused on, on marketing? Because it focuses specifically on diversity officers. She, she, she just she just told you it is it is a networking hub for chief diversity officers and or DEI consultants. That's what makes it different from the American American Marketing Association, because DEI can encompass any part of a business and all parts of a business at the same time. I I I I don't understand why that would need to be clarified. Yeah, well, um, I mean, our north star is really about inclusion, and so I. Yeah, well, you have to move it to inclusion. You can't use diversity as much anymore. They're going to phase out diversity. They're going to start using other words. They're going to start decentralizing diversity because, as I've said, the argument for diversity was, was what was found to be unconstitutionally justifiable for discriminating on the basis of race in the affirmative action case. So companies and organizations that continue to push the word diversity and the mechanisms behind it in the DEI ethos, they're setting themselves up already and for years now legal problems i should say that bridge is an acronym for belonging representation inclusion diversity the g is the gap in all of those things and the oh the g is the gap well hell i just need to go get myself a v-neck and some jeans and the e is equity and our mission is really about moving the narrative of de and i away from philosophy to operationalizing mm. inclusion as a business practice wait wait DEI's only now just been a philosophy and not a business practice. What? Holy cow. Uh, Matthew James, thank you so much. Sorry I'm late. No reason to apologize. Back to the start for me. Good day. Well, thank you, Matthew, very much. And apparently it's telling me let's celebrate their third super on a live stream. Three supers. That's that's almost like a Justice League. You just need like one or two more, and I think you got the roster filled out. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate it. Hope you're having a good Sunday. And by the time you get back to this point in the stream, uh, hello. Okay. So our North Star is that. Um, our North Star is not necessarily marketing per se, because we believe that inclusion needs to cross the entire organization, marketing included. Mm -hmm. That's just DEI. Okay, so you're taking the D and the E out of it and just saying inclusion is now the umbrella term for everything. DEI, the, the, the I in DEI was already a part of embedding itself in every part of the business. You, you are restating the very philosophy of DEI in saying that the philosophy of DEI is not what you want to focus on, but inclusion is a business practice. It's the exact same thing but uh, you know everywhere from organizational practices all the yeah. way to advocacy yeah uh, 
And so the way that we come at it um, is that we look at the business practices, across, you know, our goal is really about operationalizing inclusion, as I said, as a business practice. You keep saying that, but I don't know what you mean. Opera, okay. Inclusion as a business practice. What does that mean? What does that mean? It's not a philosophy anymore. Okay, yeah, okay. It's not a philosophy. It's a business practice. Fine, okay, okay, fine, fine. Tell me, describe the difference. Describe the difference. How is inclusion currently being implemented as a philosophy? And then how is it that you want it to be implemented as a business practice? Give me an example. Give me an active example of both states of being for inclusion, philosophy and practice. Yeah. And, you know, to your point, Sasha, what that does is it removes the dependency of DEI from an individual personal function what? and it places it squarely on everyone in the organization. Right? What, what, how, is that, how has that not been the case this entire time? What? Okay. And this just comes from seven years of watching this stuff over and over and over again. DEI is the air that we breathe. DEI is a business imperative. DEI finds itself in all things that we do. DEI must be embedded in every aspect of your company. This has been the mantra the entire time. Oh, it's no longer just about the individual. It was never about the individual. It was about the collective. It was about holding the entire company accountable for DEI for years now. What are you talking about? What, what dimension did you come from where DEI was an individual-based responsibility? What? This, this is like, uh, this is like uh, 2016, right? This is what Satsu always said. No history occurred before 2016. Anything that Trump has done since 2016 was the first time it ever happened. Are we just literally resetting the clock on diversity, equity, and are we going to go back to D ampersand I before the E was added? Oh my gosh. England, DG. Good morning to you. Happy Sunday, Scribe. Happy Sunday to you, England, DG. Hope you're doing well. Also, Chicago Mike, good morning to you. Good morning to you. Uh, okay, so I guess everything that happened in the past doesn't count anymore, and now we're starting over from scratch because gap in bridge. Right. Um, no, 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 not right. Hold on, hold on. Sorry, do that again. Anymore. Yeah. And, you know, to your point, Sasha, what that does is it removes the dependency of DEI from an individual personal function, and it places it squarely on everyone in the organization, right? Right. Um, and so I can talk a little bit about a framework that we've created, but I'll I'll let you you know maybe ask other questions and then we can get there. Uh, no, I mean I would love to hear this framework because you are speaking my language. Right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're you're speaking my language too. Except it feels like uh, history has been erased and we're suddenly back to square one again. But whatever. Right. Um, and so I can talk a little bit about a framework that we've created, but I'll. I'll let you, you know, maybe ask other questions and then we can get there. Uh, no, I mean, I would love to hear this framework because you are speaking my language, right? right? I have always been one that said this needs to be a part of the DNA of the organization. That's right. If something happened to the one person that's responsible, it should not make everything else fall apart. Um, that That's what's called cross training. That's what cross training is for. But it would be funny if like, well, the DEI executive's not around, so maybe we should just do our jobs. <laughs> instead of walking on eggshells about what we can say or do, instead of like hiring people on the basis of what they look like or not hiring people on the basis of what they look like, maybe we should just like do the jobs we were hired to do and not spend time doing advocacy work and extracurricular activities that have nothing to do with advancing uh, the fortunes of the business and are just there for aesthetic purposes, window dressing and PR. Heaven for Finn. But yeah, okay. So, so you want to ensure that the chief diversity officer does not have to do as much work because everybody else is lifting the load of the person paid 
to oversee diversity, equity, and inclusion. Is, is that what I'm hearing? That sounds like what I'm hearing. And so one of the things that we're noticing right now is so many organizations are letting go or cutting back the resources or funds to their diversity and inclusion offices, their chief diversity officers, et cetera. Why would they do that? And people are just like, okay, so if that's gone, what else do we do? Uh, I don't know. Find a real job. And it's like, it is, it should be part of your DNA. It should be part of your, your everyday operations, regardless of um, which department you're a part of. And it goes beyond your employees. Why? Why, how, why should it be? You have to make the business case. <laughs> I, I heard for years, you shouldn't have to make the business case for diversity. Like, well, y yes, you actually do. Because if you're going to assign it a budget, you have to show there's a return on investment in some way, shape, or form. Uh, thank you, Chicago Mike. You're speaking my language. Word salad is a language? Yes. Yes, it is. Because if you hear somebody else spouting off a whole bunch of corporate nonsense, it justifies and validates your own corporate nonsense. You feel as though you're among peers, that you're not alone in your gobbledygook. And that, you know, somehow it is some professional career tool. Uh, and thank you, England DG, again. I can't make cheeseburgers and fries for clients without approval from the diversity executive. That would be funny, wouldn't it? That would be funny if DEI is so embedded into every aspect of the business that nothing can be done without first making sure. Is this particular practice diverse enough? Am I promoting inclusion by putting pickles on this burger? Or should I, you know, avoid some cultural appropriation by leaving onions there as well? That didn't make any sense, did it? Oh, great. I'm ready for my diversity executive office. Um, right. Right. Yeah. How 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 dependent do you want to make the entire business on a less than definable concept like DEI? I guess very much because that still justifies your paychecks. Every time I hear this, you know, someone talks about, oh, they're cutting the budgets, DEI practice and everything else. You need to make it part of your DNA. You need to make it part of your everyday practices. All I hear in my head is, I need to keep my job. I need to keep my job. Stop invalidating my career. My entire profession and lifestyle is dependent on keeping DEI present. That's what I hear. Uh, that, that's exactly what I heard in that roundtable discussion with DEI uh, specialists. Uh, gosh, I guess it has to be now about a year or so or more now. They, they sounded so scared when d budgets started to be cut. They were so flailing about trying to justify themselves. Like right. how is it impacting the industry that you're a part of? How is it impacting your customers and clients? You know, all of those things. And so, mm -hmm. like I said, you're, you're speaking my language. Uh -huh. Um <laughs> So, you know, tell us a little bit about this framework, because I think, yes. you know, many of the people that listen to the show are, you know, some are DEI practitioners, some are in HR or in culture teams. Some are just DEI observers and critics. I, I mean, some could be. I might be some all by myself. And some are just leaders, you know, within their yes. organizations that want to be more inclusive. Well, I mean, I am a leader of my own organization. I am the, you know, chief executive officer of the Scribe Light channel. I want to be more inclusive. So I'm really, really working on, you know, diversifying my workforce. Uh, I mean, there's me and then there's, you know. Whoa, like, we. Whoa, whoa. Oh, yeah. There's Dogcat Fox, right? Dogcat Fox. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, Dogcat Fox is here. Dogcat Fox, he is the most, di sorry, it. It is the most diverse member of my team. Uh, it is both a dog, a cat, and a fox at the same time, and also not human. So I, I think I think I've reached peak diversity. I have a, a a workforce of two, and one employee covers so many demographics. I, I think that makes me a perfect person in practically every way. Uh, thank you again, Chicago Mike. New drinking game. You're speaking my language. Uh, be careful now. There's still a lot to go in this thing. We have a, about uh, still about half an hour to go in real time for the show. So I, I don't want anybody overdoing it in the drinking game because I have a feeling you're speaking my language or simply the word inclusion would probably send you to the hospital. And so if 
if you could share that framework so people have an understanding of, okay, this, these are some things I need to be considering or thinking about. Yeah. So, um, okay. So we decided um, kind of early on when we, um, when, when, you know, we created Bridge and, um, and, you know, it should be said that we're still a young organization. Yeah. You're only about a year old or thereabouts. England DG again. Thank you so much. Hey. Was that, was that a good hick? Hey. All right, be careful now. Don't overdo it. I know, I know things in England are a bit different when it comes to the imbibement of things, but just, just take care of it. Thank you so much. Uh, we're not yet a toddler, but I, but you know, we, we're courageous. So we act like teenagers. <laughs> Really, you act like teenagers. Uh, how many drink mixers are you having at your event this year? Um, and so, um, and so, uh, very early on, I got, I was connected. So I had worked in a past, you know, past project with an incredible um, professor of marketing uh -huh. uh, at Emory University, Dr. Omar Rodriguez Villa. Oh, he's going to be a speaker at the Bridge Twenty Four Twenty Four event. We just uh, saw that in the uh, the event listing. Okay. So a, a hero of yours you've invited to speak. All right. And I was talking to him when I was creating a uh, bridge and I said, you know, Omar, what can, what research can we do that will change the trajectory and start to allow people, everyone in every company to understand that inclusion is the job of all. And uh, well, you know, McKinsey has been doing several studies over the years. You could go there. Not the job of one. And mm -hmm. so together we created a research program called Voices of Inclusion. And what we wanted to do was to understand what the business practices were that mm -hmm. contribute to equities or inequities in the marketplace. Okay. By all means, describe these business practices. We focused on the marketplace because clearly there would be dependencies on the workplace and there was not, there's not a lot of research out there on the marketplace, right? Oh, yeah, no, there's absolutely no research in the marketplace regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, never mind the veracity of it, if there was any, because there's not, obviously. But no, in the last oh, seven or ten years, there's never been any marketplace research on diversity, equity, or inclusion. There just hasn't been. This really, Bridge really is the 2016 of DEI, isn't it? Nothing occurred before this. Everything is new is what it sounds like to me. Right. And so if you're an inclusive brand in the marketplace, then you're obviously doing some pretty good stuff in the workplace. If you say so. So we interviewed about 50 chief diversity officers, chief marketing officers, and CEOs. Uh -huh. And um, and what I should say, just as a kind of aside, uh, Sasha, I think it's important, is if you look at the bridge board of directors... And we have... You'll mm -hmm. see an intersection between... Chief diversity officers. So we have like the chief diversity officer from Discover Financial and Unilever and Nielsen. But then we have the marketing leaders from Colgate and Indeed and Campbell's. And then we have CEOs from a number of different companies. Uh huh. And um, because we believe, again, this is kind of acting out on our mission is that the change needs to happen at that intersection of DE and our marketing and business. So uh huh. And this is a brand new idea that has never been brought up before. And of course, marketing an idea that is demonstrably a waste of money and legally questionable. Yeah. Yeah. Get as many people on board, get as many people liable <laughs> as you can. Spread the wealth of responsibility across all sectors of business in multiple companies. Uh huh. We were intentional about how we built the board. Yes. Uh, I know you were intentional. I can only imagine what your decision-making process was regarding the appearance of your board members. Um, in the same way, we we interviewed um, that cross-functional section mm -hmm. of leaders, C CDOs, CMOs, and CEOs to uncover what the business practices were that, that, as I said, contribute either to equities or inequities in the marketplace. Okay, would you like to name some of those practices just for our own edification? Uh, thank you again, England DG. I remember Colgate's have white teeth marketing of the past. So racism, we live in the future. Yes. Marketing is very important when trying to sell bad ideas to people with good intentions. Um, 
but yeah, white teeth. Yeah, you know, got, there, there's not much diversity in healthy teeth. I mean, in, in any aspect of the animal kingdom, there's really no diversity in healthy teeth. It's just either they are or they look kind of sour. But uh, sour looking teeth is something that England DG would know something about because British dental practices. I Somehow this just comes back to me making fun of irate Alex. That's all. I, I, I don't know how I get there. The, the point A is where I am. Point Z is making fun of irate Alex. And then actually, I think he has pretty good teeth. I've seen him smile before. I think, I mean, you know, the camera can add seven shades of, of health to teeth sometimes, but I, I don't know where I'm going with this. I, I I'm just so distracted by the inclusion of all of it. And we know that there are a lot of inequities, right? Whether oh, you sure we do inequities, except they're probably just disparities. But, um, getting a mortgage or leasing a car or walking down um, the beauty aisle in a supermarket or a, you know, or a pharmacy. Uh -huh. So you're going to ignore market trends in order to stock the shelves with products that make you feel better about the demographic split that you want to see in products, even if those products don't sell because the market forces have already told you they don't, but you need them to be there. So, okay. Now, admittedly, admittedly, I am an English major. I do not have a degree in marketing. I do not have a degree in business. So if I'm completely off base here in saying that we have to defy market forces in order to make things look better and make us feel better about ourselves, if, if, if that actually is a good business strategy in some way, then I... I, I must be wearing orthopedic shoes and I'll stand corrected. Otherwise, sounds like nonsense. And um, through that research, we the, the, we literally um, uncovered 72 business practices across five dimensions of the organization. Yeah. Okay. Um, the and, and so the pillars that we are that we focused on were organization practices. Organization practices. Okay. Marketing management practices. Marketing management practices. Okay. Mm -hmm. Commercial practices. Em emotional practices? Is that what she said? So maybe I'll back up for a second. Organization practices is laying the foundation, right? Like uh -huh. um, who's your team, et cetera. Uh -huh. um, marketing management practices is about how do you see the market? How do you segment your marketplace? How do you understand the communities that are in your that you know you want to target in your market? How do you create more potential communities that you're not currently talking to and, and marketing to? Uh okay. So just marketing strategy. Uh-huh. And then on the marketplace side, there's commercial practices and the commercial Oh, commercial. I thought she said emotional. Pardon me. Commercial practices. Uh. Practices is how do you serve your market, right? What uh. are the products and services that you create? The pricing, how do you develop products um, with different communities in mind? <sighs> then we have marketing communications practice, which obviously, you know, how do you communicate? How do you come? How do you how does your brand show up in the marketplace? And then advocacy practices, which is obviously, you know, how do you how do you advocate for the community, et cetera, that you're serving? Okay, I'm. It all sounds like nonsense to me, but I'm. I am curious, and I'm sure I'll be curious as as things develop with Bridge, over time. This focus on marketing, making marketing uh, departments in companies uh, key to this particular philosophy. You know, because DEI has always talked about being part of every element of the organization. We've we've looked at countless panel discussions and corporate videos and things that talk about that. It is I, I'm wondering is it specifically because our speaker is the founder has a background in marketing that that she she finds that to be a good focus or is there some other mechanical reason why marketing is being put up as the the primary driver of Bridge. I'm 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 not I'm probably not smart enough to figure it out right now, and it's probably obvious to anybody else who has some kind of uh, experience with business. I just find it interesting that she's picked a very specific part of the business process 
and put that up on the pedestal of this entire deal. So we re so the research revealed these 72 business practices across five dimensions. And we, um, the academic team, which by the way, um, Omar brought in uh, professors from Emory. So he's from Emory University, then from the University of Georgia and Indiana University. So it was like some of the best academic minds that are out there. Well, you didn't list anybody from Stanford. I mean, you can't have an effective DEI strategy or social justice regimen without stand. Um, and we said, okay, so now what do we do with this research that it can make it actionable? Because everything right. that Bridge does, we want to make it actionable. What do we do with this research to make it? It sounds like you started with a conclusion and then created research to justify your actions. Or am I completely off base? England DG, thank you again. Why don't black people buy more golf balls? Racism, of course. Well, okay. I mean, admittedly, the market and the sales figures for golf balls went off a cliff in the last week because OJ Simpson died. I mean, if ever there was a reason for golf balls to be sold, it was O.J. Simpson tirelessly going out there to every golf course he could find searching for the true killer. But now, uh, somehow, Titleist will just have to make up the difference. I don't know how, but some way, somehow. Thank you, England. So we converted the research into um, an inclusion maturity assessment tool. Right. Mm. Which is called... Uh, which Bridge has now called IMAX. And IMAX is... No no copyright infringement intended, guys. Really, really. We're not filming movies. We're, we're solving for diversity. Inclusion, maturity assessment, and capability building. Because what was, what was important to us was not only for companies to see where they are, but also to understand how they can get to um, increased inclusion maturity, right? How Okay, how does this all resolve down to profits? Again, you have to make the business case. You have to say, if we're going to invest $100,000 a year into the salary of a chief diversity officer, how is that chief diversity officer driving increased revenue and profits? You, you, you have to show that. Everything you're talking about has to resolve down to dollars added to the bottom line. So how does inclusion maturity equal money? If you can't do that, then you're just going to continue to see DEI budgets and DEI officers being cut out of the process because there's no visible return. Only those companies that can afford to consistently lose money on this investment i.e. Google or Facebook or Microsoft and so on, where they can just, you know, write it off as a tax uh, tax write-off or something. Those are the only companies that could conceivably just continue dumping money into DEI endlessly. But even they have cut their budgets and even they have let go uh, chief diversity officers, some of them. So if even the companies that don't have to worry about money worry about money in this regard, you have to prove prove a return on investment. All of this measurement bar chart gobbledygook means nothing unless you're going to draw a line between if you do what we say, your numbers in profits will go up. When do we get to that part? If you have that part to get to. How do they build capabilities internally to improve their inclusion maturity? So a company would take the assessment, and by the way, you can do the assessment at both the company level and at the brand level. Uh -huh. Okay. So a company like Sephora has 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 done the program with us. They did it at the company level. Um, uh -huh. A company like Campbell's, who has obviously a portfolio of brands, right? They did. They chose to start with two brands, uh -huh. and what was really interesting was that one of the brands had a higher inclusion maturity than the other. Oh my gosh, why? What was the differential? So what they could think, what they could see, right, was that they had a core competency in the organization. It just wasn't extending across the organization. What was that core competency? What are you talking about? And how do I know that this inclusion maturity assessment isn't 
just the same as some sort of like horror scope test or something. Mm -hmm. um, so when a company when a company will take the assessment, right, mm -hmm. they will get an overall brand inclusion maturity score. Where are they against, uh, uh, you know, on the scale of inclusion? Where are they on the scale of inclusion? I know I, I'm not. I'm not going to get an answer. What are you talking about? By what metric do you tell the maturity of inclusion? W what is the model? What, what's the number? What's the measurement? What are you talking about uh, mm -hmm. from the maturity perspective? And then they will get very granular um, scores against each one of those business practices. Mm -hmm. What? Um, and we can do it both B2C companies and B2B companies. I, I'm sure you'll take on any client willing to pay your fee. Um, okay. Whether you're a, you know, a consumer facing brand or whether you're a company that is a B2B company, we uh -huh. can do the same because it doesn't matter what industry you're in. In inclusion as a business practice must become part of um, the imper a business imperative for every company. Okay, you, you've taken off the D, you've taken off the E, you've left the I, and it's the exact same sales pitch that I've heard about DEI for the last seven years. It's it, nothing this lady is saying, philosophically speaking, is any different than everything that's been said before. And just like nearly everything that's been said before, no details are given, no examples are offered. It's just, this is the right thing to do, and I have the magic meter stick by which to do it. That's it. People are still scrambling to try to uh, intelligenceize <laughs> and justify this nonsense. Uh, and more so now, more so now that people are becoming more aware of DEI, and after the affirmative action decision, more aware of just how, I mean, it's not even legally tenuous. It's just legally bankrupt. The entire DEI apparatus has been the entire time. It's it's not that it was suddenly brought into question because of affirmative action. It was always, always stepping on Title VII at the very least, the 14th Amendment and Title VI if you're taking government contracts. Always. The, the affirmative action policy in universities did not somehow grant uh, immunity to private business in being discriminatory in their hiring. It never did, never has. Yeah, you, that was actually gonna be my next question because I was just listening to the brands that you were talking about. Campbell's and Unilever or whatever. And again, cause I was, a, I'm a marketer, I was a marketer. Uh, okay, you, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I used to work with uh, consumer product goods yeah. quite uh -huh. a bit. And so when I was hearing the companies that you're naming, I'm like, okay, so this may work best with CPG type companies, but you're saying, no, this could be, Products, this could be services. It, it, I will take anyone willing to cut us a check. <laughs> do, do you mean to say that my diversity trade group, which doesn't actually apply to any specific product or industry, is available to any product and industry? Wow, it's almost like the entire... Ah... <sighs> That's why DEI is so insidious. It applies to nothing, but yet can be imbued in everything all the time. This is why DEI consultants have had a field day over the last decade, right? It doesn't matter whether you actually have any direct experience with the industry or the product for your client company. You're not there to help them with their product or their business. You're there to critique them on the aesthetic of their workforce. So of course it can apply to anything. We we really are going back in time, aren't we? Uh, just not with the DeLorean. Uh, thank you again, England DG. The silly promise of an untapped market. Everyone knows black people don't like soup. <laughs> oh, Jesus. What, Campbell's? Uh, yeah, some brands of Campbell's had their inclusion index at this, and the other ones didn't. Well, their core competency was... This is such such a grift. It still is a grift. It's the same grift. It's nothing about what I'm hearing has changed. Fancy bar charts don't change the fact that this is all just nonsense. 
This can exactly. be, you know, any organization. Retailers. Um, mm -hmm. We're actually in the process. Um, we're actually in the process of adding a sixth pillar. Adding a sixth? Wait, wait, wait. You got 72 practices that affect equity. You've got five pillars. You're adding a sixth pillar? Boy, oh boy. Do you have to hire a mason for that? Which is going to be the in-store experience. The in-store experience. Oh, okay. How are you going to inject inclusion into the in-store experience without, again, I guess, bucking market trends to what? Make everything look better? Because, mm -hmm. right, it's really important. We know that there's... Um, there's unfortunately a lot of discrimination in how different people are treated within, uh, with the, in, you know, within the store experience. Uh, okay. You want to give us some examples? And so we are going to add now a sixth pillar, which is business practices that contribute to equity within the in-store experience. Oh, equity in the in-store experience. I thought it was inclusion. I, I thought inclusion was your North Star. Inclusion, maturity, but now we're back to equity. Oh, what's the difference again? Um, and we're working, you know, with Sephora and a number of retailers to do that. Sephora, Sephora, you say? Well, I seem to recall that one of your board members is a, a, a big muckety muck in Sephora, and you know, I, I might have a video that we'll look at in the near future in this series, looking at the uh, the top heads of Bridge and what they have to say about diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I'm pretty sure is going to sound exactly like everything else that's been said about diversity, equity, and inclusion for the last decade. Uh, holy cow, England DG, I, I can't thank you enough for your generosity. Uh, white woman, we are going to impact the in-store experience because we know black people like to grab and go. I'm not the racist, unquote. Hey, now. Hey, now. Are, are, are you in uh, San Francisco by any chance? Uh, the in-store experience. Well, she's already talking about like you walk through the in-store, you, you walk through, you don't see products on the shelves that apply to this, that, and the other. And like, well, uh, so what are you going to do? You talk. I mean, she's so focused on marketing, making marketing a part of the entire uh, process. And yet it sounds like, and again, English major here, not business major. It sounds like she's advising companies to buck market trends, to stock the shelves with things that she thinks or society thinks specifically apply to specific uh, demographics of race. Otherwise, you're not being inclusive. Uh, let's see. Uh, Avi, I didn't. I don't get to catch you live. I'm in the past right now, starting from the beginning. Just want to say hi and love your content. Well, thank you, Avi. I appreciate it. I hope it's useful in some way, shape, or form, at least for informational purposes, if nothing else. I don't know how much of an entertainer I am, but... And, uh, okay, I'll give it another minute or two here to see if we can find a good stopping point, and then I'm going to probably wrap things up, unless unless something really amazing is about to be said. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very flexible assessment where we will customize it, right? So, obviously... Wait, 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 wait. If it's a flexible assessment and you can customize it, then what's the standard? If you don't have a standard, if you're going to change it for every client... <laughs> I okay. I I obviously don't understand. I'm sure it makes sense if I was actually being told anything about how it works. So Flora's commercial practice is going to be different than Campbell's commercial practices. Right. Well, yes, one is marketing soup and one is marketing makeup. So you're correct. But the 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 fundamental levers of marketing, I think, and I could, I, I'm happy to be corrected. I think they remain the same in the realm of just product marketing. Whether whether it's makeup or soup, I think there are some commonalities in business practices when it comes to marketing. And so why would you need to customize your assessment? Okay. Right. So we go in and we understand the, the, the company and we customize it. What's, what's really, I think, powerful about the process is that you can have information within six weeks. This is not a long, drawn-out, lengthy assessment where you need 300 people taking it. This is where you need like cross-functional, um, very good representation across mm -hmm. both you know, gender, racial, uh, differing abilities, et cetera, um, different you know, kind of... Um, 
uh, seniority, right? So you want leaders and associates. Wow, it sounds kind of so. So you're measuring companies on racial, gender, and ability demographics. And this doesn't take six weeks. It just happens. Oh, okay. So it's, it's it's basically like inclusive fast food. But the truth is, if you get 30 to 40 people within your organization taking the assessment, you'll get a very true reading of where you are on the, on the scale of inclusion maturity. Really? Really? So you don't need to interview the entire company to find out the, you know, the, the heartbeat of everything. You just need 30 or 40 people. How do you decide on who these 30 or 40 people are? And I, and I was told, I was told not too long ago that uh, this entire philosophy needs to move away from putting the responsibility on the individual and instead putting the responsibility on everyone. But at least in the assessment process, we just need, you know, a small fraction of your workforce to really tell us what direction to go. Okay. Well, with that and a very clear mentioning of uh, demographics that are legally questionable in measuring and such, I think I'll stop the video here for the time being. Uh, but before that, holy cow, England again, thank you so much. Ah, we need cream of mushroom and LGBTQ plus mushroom without cream for diversity. Sales will quadruple. Uh, yes, let's, let's put rainbow banners on all our Campbell soup cans on the one instance. And then in Sephora stuff, we need to put uh, the, the the fist symbol up in order to show our allegiance with Black Lives Matter. Um, and that will become more inclusive in the in-store experience or something. I don't know. Anyway, that is a sampling of both the chair of Bridge and the CEO slash founder of Bridge uh, talking about their uh, philosophies or thoughts on DEI or just inclusion or just equity because they're moving away from talking about diversity, even though they can't quite avoid it. They're going to have to move away if they're going to continue to try, and I mean try, to dodge uh, the legal pitfalls of the entire thing. Uh, but yes, a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion trade group bridge where the G stands for GAP apparently, uh, which unbeknownst to me made my thumbnail more accurate than I could have imagined. Uh, but if you don't know what the thumbnail looks like, you'll just have to, you know, reverse out and take a look. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I think I'm going to do a series, a bridge series, looking at, as I can find them, uh, testimonials from the various individuals at the head or members of the bridge organization and to see what they have to say about their uh, perspectives on DEI and elsewise. Uh, I have a couple of other videos already gathered for this very uh, thing. Uh, I don't know that I'll do it as like the perpetual Sunday stream, right? Like every Sunday now will be a bridge stream until I get done with that. Uh, they may end up being ambush streams here and there as I'm able. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I think I'm gonna do a series, turn it into a playlist of listening to the uh, heads of bridge, the heads of bridge. Uh, talking about what they have to say, because if Bridge is the new collective for the trade that is diversity, equity, and inclusion, it may indeed become a font of interesting things that people say in positions of power, not unlike TEDx. I can only hope that Bridge's YouTube site will continue to have elements and speeches and testimonials from uh, members thereof. Because I think I think they have a YouTube site, don't they? Or am I off? Am I am I misremembering things now? If they don't have a YouTube site, I hope they have a YouTube site. And if they put one up, I hope they give us clips from the upcoming Bridge 24 event because I'd love to see some stuff out of that. Although they'll probably keep that private. They wouldn't want they wouldn't want anybody to say anything publicly that they might live to regret legally in the future. But I suppose we'll find out. Uh, a couple more minutes here to see what you guys have to say. Datura Jones, not the good kind of fungus among us, clearly. Oh, as far as mushroom soup's concerned, probably not. Uh, Genty Max says Sweden. Sure, Sweden. Uh, her bets on Sweden. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Shadow Claw. I guess KFC should stop cooking white meat, only dark meat allowed. Well, I mean, oh man, <laughs> the in store experience. I would love to know what she, I, 
again, the, the, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. I would love to hear some active examples of what Bridge is advising Campbell's Soup to do, or actually, I guess it makes more sense for Sephora, what Sephora is supposed to do to improve the in-store experience for equity. Like, what could Sephora do to increase equity for the in-store experience? I don't know. I'd love to know. Maybe sometime we'll find out. Maybe there's a video from the Sephora executive I'll be looking at in the near future. Could be. Uh, either way, just as a note again, uh, previous looks at Bridge has have taken place by another YouTuber, uh, a, a YouTuber and VTuber, Yanch or Yanchi. I'm probably saying it incorrectly. Apologies if I am. Uh, link to her channel is below. She's appeared on side scrollers and with it's a Gundam talking about bridge previously. In fact, I think she looked over some clips from this very video with it's a Gundam. So go check out that. Um, beyond that, uh, tonight, I think maybe I'm not hundred percent sure yet. I think I have to verify, uh, but purportedly fingers crossed, I'll be appearing on midnight's edge after dark for the shit list where I think we're going to go over top five war movies because that civil war movie is out and we're going to discuss war movies. I think, I don't know. I haven't heard much, but it should happen either way. If you, if that doesn't happen tonight, go check out midnight's edge after dark. Either way, if you like movies and pop culture and things like that, plenty of material there for you to look at. And as always on Thursdays at 6 PM Pacific, 9 PM Eastern, you can find me here for Ted excellence, where I'll take a look at another off brand Ted talk for education and enjoyment. I call it uh, E-A-E-X, -E uh, Campbell's. It, 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 it makes sense, you know, if I spent the time to do so. Also, if you'd like to join the Discord server, there's a link in the, the uh, chat right now for Discord. You have to click on that. You'll find yourself on the landing channel called Say Hello. All you have to do is say hello there as well as give the secret word. The secret word will tell me that you are not a bot and will thus have earned the right, the privilege, the entitlement to join the Discord server. And today's secret word is IMAX because trademark infringement. <laughs> IMAX, just go into uh, the Discord and say, hello, IMAX, and I'll know that you have joined. I will know that you have joined. I will know that you're human and can join the Discord server. But with that, and before my vocabulary completely fails me, everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. Hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to leave a like, share it out if you want to. Let people know about Bridge and how history has restarted itself all over again, apparently. Uh, moderators, thank you for keeping an eye on things. Even though everyone here is so well behaved, you have very, very little to do. Everybody who donated, holy cow, you guys, I tell you what, I don't know what to say other than thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity, whether it was to me or to the GoFundMe's pinned to the top of the chat box. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And with that, everyone, have a good rest of your Sunday and weekend. I hope you are all safe and well. If you are not well, please get well soon, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye bye.